Well, thank you. It's good to come back again. I think it's been a few years since we had the opportunity to come and share a little bit about Tools with a Mission. And you've heard a bit about Vic, um, that we have over than, older than 90 um, with us. We have one guy who said he'd retire at 90. It's now 92, and he's still going. So it, it's amazing, the commitment of people. Well, as it's Palm Sunday, I thought we would combine the two and read, therefore, from Luke 19, 28 to 40, where Luke tells us this. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you're untying it, say, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he told them. As they were untying the colt, the owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, a whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is a king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Well, today I'd like us to note three things from this passage based on a donkey and a few stones. Firstly, God cares about the small things. Secondly, God chooses to use us. And thirdly, in this passage, God asks one thing of us. And we'll start with the donkey, or a young donkey, a colt. But why did Jesus ask of all things for a donkey? Now, the answer the obvious answer is to fulfill a prophecy. Um, Gareth read that to us earlier on, didn't he? In Zechariah 9, 9, where we read, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. But that doesn't really answer the question as to why did Jesus choose a donkey, because... God gave those words to Zechariah in the first place, so we still have to ask the question, well, why did God choose a donkey? So Jesus, in turn, could choose a donkey to ride down the Mount of Olives. Well, firstly, in biblical times, not much has changed. Kings rode horses, and they rode them to war. Donkeys tend to be ridden by poor people going to market. Secondly, in terms of a king, when he was going to war, he rode on a horse. But when he was coming for peace to his own people, he would ride on a donkey. Solomon did this many times, if you read his account. In 1 Kings 133, for example, at his inauguration of being the king, you would have thought, well, surely that's the time you would ride a great horse, but he rode a donkey. And in the very next verse of the prophecy, we just read from uh, Zechariah in verse 10, we read, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem. So the donkey was about peace. It was about common people. It was about kings coming 
in a way that they would relate to their people and not create fear, oh, the king's come, but create that sense of peace and of comfort that the king comes. So when Jesus rides a donkey, he signifies, I am a king, and I am a king coming for victory, but the victory is peace. And the victory isn't just peace for the high and mighty and the great and the good. The peace is for the common people, it's for the oppressed, it's for the lonely, it's for the sick. Something he proved beyond question over and over again. Hence, when they come and they start to rejoice, they're rejoicing for all the things they have seen, all the miracles they've seen over the three years he has been with them. So it's incredibly powerful and for them a very well understood message. Hence their response is joy, absolute and complete joy. And the people cheer for him, for those in leadership who want to actually make it all about the great and the good and themselves. They hate him for this message because he's making the poor people and the oppressed the most important as he rides down as a king on a donkey. And to a great extent, that's true of tools with a mission and what we try and do as we embrace the small things and see that small things can bring about large, if not enormous, unbelievable results. And one example is this. This <coughs> is the Emmanuel School in Lusaka, Zambia. It has 500 pupils. It has an orphanage that currently, when I, when I went, had eight orphans and two house mothers. And it's run by a small brethren church with just 40 members. It's in an area of extreme poverty, and about 180 of the 500 students can afford to pay the school fees. And the school fees were 50 quach or about £2 a month. Now, a basic government school would charge around £80 a month. So I think we can understand why the school reached out for help. But what would it cost if they came to to Mickfield and said, look, you're a prosperous little church. Could you fund our school? Well, based on those government figures of £80 per month per, per pupil, 500 pupils, that would amount to £360,000 a year. Is that okay? Can we do that? Just think of the lives you're going to change for £360,000 a year. It's worth every penny, isn't it? But it's a lot of money, isn't it? And the trouble is, they're not going to ask you just one year, are they? They're going to come back the next year, and the next year, and the next year. Well, that's a big deal, isn't it? But how about we focus on the donkey? How about we focus on the small things? How about they said, now, do you think you could manage 350 pounds? Oh, we think that, that sounds better, doesn't it? £350 a year? Yep, we can do that. No, no worries at all. They said, no, no, no. Not £350 a year. £350. That's all we want. And with that, we will fund a school of 500 children. And we will fund an orphanage. And we think, no, that's, that's just not possible. That's absolute nonsense. It just can't be done. Well, they knew it could. And that's why when they needed help, they didn't, they didn't try and find a big charity with that kind of money, because they knew they'd probably never find one. They turned to tools with a mission. And they asked us for a carpentry workshop kit and a few sewing machines. And you think, that's a strange thing to ask for, isn't it? But it wasn't, they knew exactly what they were doing. Because 
They got a small workshop. This is it. Doesn't look much, does it? From a, a local supporter, and they put a call out to the parents of the children and their own congregation who knew carpentry. And they started a carpentry workshop with that very large workshop kit that we sent them. And, and with the work they did, they started to make furniture, loads of furniture, some very impressive furniture. And with that, they started to raise money. That's quite a nice wardrobe coming together there, isn't it? And the amount of money they've raised from making furniture six days a week, ten hours a day, has actually funded the running of that school. Now, to be fair, it didn't fund the biggest budget, which was the salaries of their staff. And that's why they got sewing machines. Because after school, all the staff get together and they make clothes. They make their own clothes, but they make lots more clothes that they sell. And that is the way the fund staff their work in the school. So it's true. You wouldn't believe it if it wasn't true, but it actually is true that £350 is funding a school of 500 pupils and an orphanage. And that's a tremendous challenge not to despise the small things, isn't it? That just tools that were going to landfill, tools that were unloved and unwanted, have now gone out and have allowed this incredible miracle of provision to be done. It's quite extraordinary and it's a wonderful lesson to us all, I think. We don't have to, for us too, we don't have to be rich, we don't have to be clever, we don't have to be strong, we don't have to be young, we don't have to be well educated for the Lord to use us. The Lord can use the small things, whether it's a person or it's literally a sewing machine, as we've heard about from Vic, or, or screwdrivers or anything else. The Lord's happy with a donkey and can do amazing things with just a donkey. And let's face it, we all look good next to a donkey, don't we? So firstly, God cares about the small things. Secondly, God chooses to use us. We see this in verses 30, 31, where we read, Jesus says, untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Now, the wording is very poignant. Uh, Jesus could have said, the Lord wants it. The Lord would like it. The Lord is destined to ride it. All would have worked, wouldn't they? But he chose instead to say, the Lord needs it. Now, time and time again, Jesus showed us he deliberately and intentionally chose to use people. And sometimes, seemingly, they're completely worthless offerings were it a few fish and bread to feed 5,000 people, were it a rogue like Zacchaeus to share great wealth with the poor. Now, we often say, well, the Lord does not need us to fulfil his purposes. He's quite capable of doing that without us. And on one level, that's true. But on another level, he chooses to work through us, we are essential to his fulfilment of his purposes. We see that in the famous call of Isaiah, where in Isaiah 6, 8, the Lord says, or he says, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And the Lord makes it clear, I need someone to go for me. And I'm saying this to you, Elijah, um, because... Isaiah, because you're going to stand up and say, oops, I'll go. Let's go. And we read constantly, Paul says, how will they believe if no one tells them? So, there's an imperceivable line between the Lord choosing to use us 
and the Lord choosing to need us to go and be his light in the world. Now, one group I met in Lusaka highlighted this point very powerfully. It's called the Upimi Project, and it reaches out to young girls forced into sex work. Gladys is one of the girls, the, the, the one in the red, um, who I talked to. And horse, her story was so typical uh, when she said, I am 19 years old and live with my grandparents because my parents died three years ago. I have three brothers and three sisters. I had to drop out of school because there was no money for fees. I come here, the Upini Project, because I want to help my sisters and brothers I am the oldest and I want to help them go to school. I want my own sewing machine and knitting machine to start a business in the market. So she tells us, oh, it's so typical. I've lost both my parents. That's the reality of poverty around the world. She's now leading a child-headed family. She's had to drop out of school. She has no future whatsoever. She's living with grandparents too old to work. There's no pensions. There's no social services. And therefore, all the pressure is on her to feed the family. But what can she do? Well, she's just standing there, exactly the kind of victim the street gangs look for and target. And she has absolutely no chance of being anything other than what she ended up being forced into sex work and she told as all the girls did of their experiences on the streets at, at night and in the pubs at night and they are <coughs> unrepeatable and you cannot say to her you shouldn't be doing this she knows she shouldn't be doing this what you have to say to his her is you shouldn't be doing this and here is an alternative and then they go for it. And for Gladys and the other girls, it was in being invited by an amazing family to come away and learn tailoring and knitting whilst being supported by a church. Then when they graduate, they're given their own knitting machine or sewing machine to begin their own business and provide for their families. They also get spiritual and emotional counselling. My goodness, they need it. And many of the girls, like Gladys, have become Christians. And this, this wonderful picture shows Gladys with her knitting machine and caressing it with such love because she knows this is going to change her life. Just a hand-me-down sewing machine loads of people bought once and now nobody knows what to do with well she does and it will change her life but it's only because one man stood up when the Lord broke his heart and said the Lord needs me to do something for these forgotten hidden girls and he's brought dozens and dozens out and again, what does it need to change a life? Oh, thousands and thousands of pounds. A sewing machine. That's it. And training. But a sewing machine, which again, we get to Africa for 25 pounds. I would challenge any of you, any of you here, to tell me how anything better that you can do with 25 pounds than this. And if you've got an answer, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> I really would. But equally, we can say, well, what's he asking of Twam? Well, it's a lot, because we're currently in the middle now of a five-year plan to double in size. We currently send 18 containers a year. That's about half a million individual tools. It's not bad, is it? But our, our vision and our calling from God is a million. So we're halfway through the million tool challenge, which will see us doubling in size. It's meant over the last two years, 
We've closed some small centres and done that in the midst of a pandemic. That's a miracle in itself. And we are now in the, the position of opening a new centre in the Midlands, in rugby, that's actually bigger than Ipswich. And that will double our, our output and our size. And it's a miracle how the Lord works. We spent much of last year looking for a new building in Coventry near our current very small site. But since the Lord gave us his plan, rents have tripled and they're almost going up, um, doubling still every single year, way above our budget. And any, most buildings are snapped up before they even come on the market by the likes of Amazon and whatever. And it seemed absolutely hopeless. Lord, what are you saying to us? Well, you told us to get a new building. And yet now the world's changed. And then I was looking for a picture of a warehouse in Coventry. That was my Google search. Warehouse in Coventry. And a picture came up of a building in Rugby, only 18 miles away. And it was the right size. The big bit round the back of it goes back it's like, a, like a TARDIS. And I looked at it and looked a bit dilapidated and I thought, oh, it's not. we want something better than that clicked away and the Lord just said go and have a look again so I looked again I thought I still don't want it Lord <laughs> clicked away he said go and look again message the agent so I sent a message, an ag a message to the agent is this, is this building still available it was about a quarter of the price of what we would have paid 18 miles away in Coven it was too good to be true um, the agent didn't get back well that proved the point didn't it we all said give him a ring pick the phone up and the one day that we could do it was the one day they could show us round. And as soon as we walked in the door, we just knew. And we went with some Christians and, and non-Christians, and everyone just walked into the door and said, this is our building. And everything's gone wrong. I mean, I could stand here forever. If we were secular charity, we would have walked away because everything about this building, the bonkers tenant that's currently in it, everything about this building is wrong. But we've held on. No, the Lord says, this is our building. We'll stick with it. We'll stick with it. We'll stick with it. When everything says walk away. And now we're getting there. And although we really wanted this building probably in March, we now know we're going to get it in June. The incredible thing is we wrote the strategic plan four years ago, long before anyone had heard of COVID. And... We put in that, that we would go into that building in the third quarter of 2022, June, July, August. God's amazing, isn't he? And he's amazing when we choose to say, Lord, here I am, send me. When we acknowledge he chooses to use us to complete his work whether it's to support a small church with a big heart for 500 kids who need to go to school, whether it's one man who just sees a desperate plight of young women and realises he's breaking the heart of Jesus and says, here I am, send me. It's amazing what God can do when we embrace and rejoice the wonder and privilege that God chooses to need us. So firstly, God cares about small things. Secondly, God chooses to use us. And finally, what is God asking of us? Well, this is normally the point where we start to feel guilty, isn't it? Oh, right, here we go. I've got to do more. I've got to give more. I've got to pray more. Basically, I've just got to, I've just got to feel guilty that I'm not as good as I should be. Well, not today, because Jesus in this passage isn't asking about any of those things. Today he's saying, I want you to give one thing, and that thing is joy. Joyful salvation and joyful wor worship. It's in that prophecy. It started in Zechariah, didn't it? Rejoice! Greatly, daughter Zion, 
Be joyful in your worship as you see your King and your Saviour coming. In Matthew, the people joyfully praise God. And when Jesus is rebuked by Jesus, if they keep quiet, the stones are going to cry out because this is a day of joy for all I'm about to do. And the events of Palm Sunday are about joy, rejoicing, worship, because here comes the King riding on a donkey to bring victory to the oppressed and the lowly. So there's cries of joy about everything and the words they sing. What are they? Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Interesting words, peace in heaven. They're singing over his impending death. And it should remind us of the words that were sung over his impending birth by the angels to the shepherds when in Luke 2, 14 they sang glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests and little did the crowd realise that these words were fulfilment of that promise see true peace on earth was never to be found with men Oh, we, don't, we don't need to, to learn that lesson, do we? We look around our world today, there's not a lot of peace among men. But the peace they're talking about is salvation and forgiveness in Jesus. And that that would lead us to our peace, not on earth, but our peace in heaven. That absolute confidence every Christian has is that Jesus has died to go there and prepare a place for us. And that's what they're, they're singing. Fulfillment of this prophecy, there is peace for you in heaven. And Palm Sunday, it is a promise of Christmas. It's the promise of Good Friday it's the promise of Easter Sunday. It's the promise of a cross of salvation and the wonder of peace. Peace with God and our true home in heaven. And for that, Jesus says, what do I ask of you? I ask you to be joyful. In worship, in service, in life. And at Twam, we're really joyful in all the things that God has done. That we've gone through, we're still going through a pandemic. Has that changed any of God's plans for us? No, it has not. It's fulfilled every single one. Because that is our God, isn't it? What joy we should feel. So we see, God cares about the small things. God chooses to use us. And God asks one thing of us and as we clo close we've had a psalm or not um, but let's have a psalm from Psalm 51 I love this as a prayer restore to me what the joy of my salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me but where does the sustaining come from joy of our salvation. So I hope as we've looked at a bit about tools of the mission, a bit about Palm Sunday, we grasp the wonderful work that TWAM is doing, I'm biased but I'm going to say it, the wonderful work that TWAM is doing, but because we have a wonderful God that rides a donkey down a hill, that each one of us would ultimately have peace in heaven. Thank you.